So like I said, um, we don't see a lot of supernovas within our galaxy because they're, well, we think they're happening quite often, but they're shrouded by dust because there's so much dust in the interstellar medium. Um, if a supernova does occur, then its luminosity spikes to billions of times the luminosity of the sun. And so some supernova events that have been observed throughout history um, have basically like some of them have outshined even Venus, which is pretty awesome. Um, once the initial event happens, that doesn't last for very long. The initial light generated by the supernova explosion persists for only days or months. Um, but after that, there's remnants that are left behind um, by all the matter that was flung out into space, and those can persist for a very long time. So this is Kepler's supernova remnant. This um, was observed in 1604, and um, looking at it in different wavelength ranges, we can see some hot gas, ultra hot gas glowing in the X-ray range. We can see other gas glowing in the infrared and then also in the visible. And so adding these all together shows you where the very hottest, it, it basically shows you where the different temperatures of gases are. Um, so looking at things like this can help us uh, model exactly how that explosion process occurs. But it's kind of limited to look at a very old stellar remnant because it does change over time. And so it doesn't tell you about exactly what occurred, you know, right after the supernova itself. So it would be really good to be able to observe with a telescope some supernovae that happen in the Milky Way galaxy. Unfortunately, the supernovae that we have observed um, recently are not in the Milky Way. They're in the Large Magellanic Cloud. So not too bad, but close enough to get some good info from. So this is supernova 1987A. Um, by its name, you might guess that it was observed in 1987. Um, and it was a type O star, more than 20 times the mass of our sun. It exploded in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which that's basically a satellite of the Milky Way. So it's like a little miniature galaxy that orbits the Milky Way galaxy. And when we observed 1987A, this is the you know, first supernova we've been able to observe with a telescope at this early stage in its process. And so that's remarkable and gave us a bunch of detail that we didn't have before. So they've, in these images, dimmed the star in the interior, and you can see a ring where the gas being flung out from the inside and the gas falling down from the inside are interacting. So this is where gas is colliding um, and producing heavy elements, etc. cetera. Um, so our neutrons and neutrinos are, are moving outward. And these little hot spots on the inside, they kind of occur like a kind of beads on a chain here. And they think that that's because the gas is organized into columns um, as it interacts. Why that would be the case, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but it's by looking at things like this that you can model um, why that might be occurring. I don't know why. So if you want to know more detail on 1987A and these beads on a ring, then uh, you can read much more about it online. It's an extremely well-studied supernova. Um, the other cool thing about this is that we can watch it change over time. So this helps us refine our models for the timing of what happens after a supernova. Um, let's see, here's a link here where you can look at a 3D reconstruction of the explosion based on all the data over time that they've observed. Um, and you can actually also watch like a time lapse of all the images that they've gathered. So that's there for you um, from the Chandra Space Telescope. So this is X-ray images. All right, we're observing in the X-ray by the way, because the gas is so hot that it glows in the X-ray. So over time, this is what happens to the, this is the magnitude of the star. So it goes from, it has a spike in brightness that only lasts for, you know, maybe days to months. And the spike comes from radioactive decay of the new elements that were created. So the neutron star itself doesn't glow as a black body. It does other cool things, but it does not have black body radiation of its own. So all of the light here is from the radioactive decay of the stuff that's left over. Um, and as 
the time goes on, our supernova uh, goes lower and lower in luminosity because there's just less nuclei available to decay after they have decayed to a stable uh, nucleus. So um, the, you know, the brightness of the object in the sky is extreme when it first happens and then just kind of uh, settles back down until the neutron star doesn't have any um, glow of its own due to its temperature. So it is, it is still a very energetic object and we'll discuss what it does next time. All right, the remnants, like I mentioned, they last for a really long time. So this supernova remnant is called Cassiopeia A. You can see kind of a filamentary structure of the um, gas that's left over. So this is the, um, the pieces that have been flung off. It's about three parsecs across. So this is something like, um, like 12-ish light years. And the light here reached us about 300 years ago. So my question for you is, if the light from Cassiopeia A reached us 300 years ago, and it's 11,000 light years away, when could it have gone supernova? All right. So doing the math here, um, light takes time to reach us. So that means that if the object is 11,000 years away, then it takes light 11,000 years to go from there to here. And so if it, um, if we first saw it 300 years ago, then it's something like, you know, close-ish to 8980 BC. So it's not all, it's not a full 11,000 BC because that would be 11,000 plus 2,000, 13,000. Um, but it's more in the range of uh, 9,000 years BC. So this star went supernova around the same time giant ground sloths went extinct around here. And I think there's other cool things that happened then like the city Jericho, which is I think the longest uh, dwelling that we have on record. That's when Jericho was founded. Um, yeah, so this happened in you know the very distant past in human history. But it's still pretty cool that an astronomical event happened within human history. Okay, so there are other supernova remnants that are fun to check out. This is the Crab Nebula. Its light reached us about a thousand years ago. The Crab Nebula was a um, supernova event that was recorded by Chinese astronomers. And then this is Tycho's remnant and Tycho Brahe saw this in 1572. Um, you can again see different wavelength ranges here. This top one is the X-ray. The bottom is a X-ray visible radio composite. 